Today, as we come to the table. But almost everybody says they know the Lord. That scares me for them because I would have been one of those people. Yes, I know the Lord. I grew up in church. I know the Lord. And I realized that when I would go and share them and say, do you know the Lord? They'd all say they did. And I was like, what do you do after that? Hey, I'd like to talk to you about Christ. Do you know the Lord? Yep. Oh, okay. Well, God bless you. And it's good to meet you. And you go to the next one. Hey, I'd like to share the Lord. Well, I know the Lord. Oh, okay. And then, and then you begin to see the people that you know, they don't know the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you're watching their life and you watch them there for just a moment. And realize this is a person that's living in the world right now. And they're saying they know the Lord. So I began to change my language. And I would say, look, have you met him personally? On a personal level, have you met him? Some people know the Lord, meaning they've heard about God. They may have gone to church a couple of times, or maybe a family member mentioned him. But when you dig deeply into their life, they don't really know what he's all about. They haven't spent time learning about him from the Word. And more importantly, they haven't been saved by the blood of Jesus. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Today's message is a bit of a wake-up call for anyone who doesn't truly know Jesus. If that's you, listen closely. You'll discover something amazing about how your life could be changed forever. It's worth it to get to know the Lord. Now, turn to Exodus chapter 5 and join Pastor Mark as he concludes his message, Let My People Go. What's neat about the whole passage here and the whole section really in in the whole thing with Exodus where God goes and brings the children of Israel out of Exodus and brings them into the promised land is God has given us a picture in this of what it's like to become a believer. Egypt in Scripture, the Bible says, is a type of the world. God goes into the world. God brings us out of Egypt. He draws us to himself and then he takes us into the promised land. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, I don't want to spend 40 years in the wilderness, right? They weren't supposed to spend 40 years in the wilderness, They were only supposed to spend two years in the wilderness. God called them out there so that he could train them, so that he could teach them. I guess you would call it spiritual boot camp, so to speak, to draw them to himself, to not send them too early into battle. All these things, we see the whole picture. God didn't even send them into the land by the way of the Philistines at first. And really, he never did. And the reason being is he didn't want them to go into battle too soon. So there's a purpose for the way God did this. And they were supposed to be there a couple of years, and then they were supposed to go into the land. But remember what happened. Because they didn't believe God, that God could defeat the giants that awaited them. They spent their entire believing life in the wilderness. Now, what a warning that is to us, guys. How many of you guys tonight are facing giants? Truly. I could never stop that. I can't have victory over that sin. I can't conquer that. That's a giant in the believer's life. Now, we see those as giants, and rightfully so in this sense. We can't overcome them in our own, can we? I mean, I can't, I can't defeat a giant in my own, but we let the Lord do it. And if we believe that God can defeat the giants in our life, then God does it, and we get to what? We get to go into the promised land. We get to walk in that fullness of the Lord and have the rest of the Lord. You know, the promised land is oftentimes presented as an image of something that happens when we die. And although that's true, God wants us to walk in the promised land right now. That is to walk in freedom, to have victory over the enemy. And so even tonight as we take communion, my heart is, is that some of you guys will be set free from some stuff, you know? As we're praying for you, just share it with the elders, share it with myself. We'll pray for you. Believe in God to set you free. You don't have to have the strength to do it. God will do it. This happens in every person's life. It comes a time in someone's life, every one of our lives, where God says to the enemy, let them go. And I believe that every person, at some point in their life, God will open their eyes. Those who hear the gospel and those who have an opportunity to receive, God will open their eyes to the truth, and they have an opportunity to receive the Lord and to reject Him. A lot of people just don't take that opportunity. They say, no, I don't want that. But God will go to the enemy and say, let him go. Back off. And I I encourage you to do this. When I pray for those that I love, that I know don't know the Lord, I ask God to rebuke the enemy and make the enemy back off. And I used to pray, God, save him, God, save him, God, save him. And I'm not saying you can't pray that, but I realized what needs to really happen is is God put their heart in a place where they desire you. Back the enemy off so they can see, and now they can come to the truth and know the truth. You know, when I... 
When I came to the Lord, actually two years before I came to the Lord, my eyes were opened. I knew that the Bible was true. God was opening my eyes, and really I think he made the enemy back off to the degree of the mental block. And I could see that the Bible was true, and I fought it for two more years. You know, I don't know how many of you guys fought it for a long time before you came, but I fought it. But then God removed it out of the way, and I was able to make that decision. And so God says, let them go. So when you pray for your family and you pray for those you love, ask God, Lord, make him let them go. And we're going to see in this whole interchange as we go through this episode with Moses and Pharaoh that Pharaoh is a picture of Satan in this thing, and Moses a picture of the Lord. This battle of let my people go, no, I won't, let them go, no, I won't. And the cool thing about it is at some point, the ones who really want to be let go, God makes him. See, if you want to be let go, God will force the enemy to let you go. He doesn't give up easily by the power of the gospel he gives up, simply the cross and Jesus Christ. But he's not going to just give up without a fight. He's going to mess with you and try to pull you away, and he's going to do all kinds of things, maybe even distract you if you hear the gospel and you don't know the Lord. I love this whole thing because, again, this whole picture of Satan here and the battle that goes on, and yet I love it because in the end, God is the one that wins the victory, and uh, he will always win the victory. He'll set us free, but he doesn't force anybody to come. And we're going to see even when they come out of Egypt, he doesn't make everybody come. Those who want to come, come out. Those who don't want to come, don't come out. As a matter of fact, we're going to see when they put the blood of the lamb on their homes, those who don't put the blood of the lamb on their home, they get the death angel visits their home and kills their firstborn. And so they don't have to. God tells the children of Israel to do it, but did they have to do it? They didn't have to. They only had to if they wanted to be saved from the death angel and be protected from the judgment that was to come. And that was the blood that was put on the house, which was that whole picture of Christ. So again, a lot of stuff here that we're going to see in this, even just in these two verses. Now, where we last left off, Moses and Aaron were showing the children of Israel the signs that God had given Moses to show them. And remember, he showed it to them, he showed it to Aaron first. Aaron was all impressed, showed it to the people. They believed, hey, God has sent you. You are the one that God has sent. And so now we believe you. And now we come to the very first confrontation of Pharaoh. And notice it says in verse 1, afterward Moses and Aaron, that is after Moses had come back and showed the signs to, you know, to Aaron, after Moses and Aaron had taken the signs to the people and they were all on board, they realized God's in this thing. It says afterward Moses and Aaron went in and they told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, some background is necessary to understand how shocking this would have been to Pharaoh. Understand, the pharaohs of that day believed that they were gods. They believed themselves. They called themselves Neder Nefer, you know, means perfect God. They had a name they even brought to themselves in the language there. They believed that they were a god as well. And then they had all their other gods that they worshipped and that they gave obeisance to. And now all of a sudden, Moses comes in here and he says, thus saith the Lord. Now, it wasn't just thus saith the Lord. In the language, it's Jehovah. So he gives the name of God, thus saith Jehovah. And why would that be important? Because they all thought they were lords. Pharaoh thought he was a lord. And lord just, as you know, means master. So the one in charge. And now Moses comes in with boldness before this one who thinks he's a god. He's got all these other gods. Oh, and by the way, by the way, who is this Moses to come in and declare his god, whoever this Jehovah is over me, your god is a god of slavery, apparently. <laughs> you guys are all slaves. My gods are greater. I'm the one in charge. I'm the one running the show. If your God was so great, you would be Pharaoh and I would be your slave. And so again, look at the pride, look at the attitude, look at what's going on here in, in Pharaoh's heart. And now all of a sudden out of the blue, this Moses comes in. He doesn't know who Moses is. You know, Moses, an 80 year old man by now, probably a fairly spry 80 year old man, considering he lived for another 40 years after this. But he comes walking in and says, thus says Jehovah. That is my God. The Lord God of Israel says this. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Jehovah, let my people go. And now he gives this command here to Pharaoh to let him go and to get him out of there. Now, again, you have to imagine Pharaoh's mindset. You know, at first, you know, I'm not making excuses for Pharaoh, but this would be a rather shocking thing for him. They had multiple gods in Egypt, and uh, they judged by where you were in life by how strong your God was. So, again, the whole picture here was you're this nobody who's coming in to lead these slaves or to tell me to let these slaves go with the God of slavery over them, and I'm supposed to listen to you. Again, this would have been offensive in his pride, and God's going to break his pride. You know, we're going to watch this whole process of God tearing Pharaoh down and dealing with his pride. God knows how to deal with our pride, doesn't he? 
He knows how to deal with it. And God's going to break Pharaoh down and, and deal with his pride, deal with the fact that he thinks he's a God, deal with the fact that now somebody's coming in saying one greater than not only he, but greater than his gods is saying, let the children of Israel go. And his pride just won't let him do it. And so uh, nobody commands Pharaoh. And that's his mindset. And uh, I love what God's telling him to do. He's saying, not, not only let him go, he's saying, leave this command, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. I love this. Because what a beautiful picture this is of what actually happens when the Lord sets us free. Guys, think back for a minute. Do you remember what it was like when you first came to the Lord? Think about it for a minute. I want you to meditate on that. I will never forget what it was like when I first came to the Lord. Now, it depends on what your background was. I don't know what it was like for someone who maybe grew up in a Christian home and always had everything right there. I only know what it was like to come from a situation that was not good. And it was very dark. And I'll never forget when I said, all right, Lord, you know, if you're real, if I can really know you, I mean, I believed he was real, but it's like, if I can really know you, like people say I can know you, I mean, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. I want to know you. And I mean, it was a feast. Guys, it was a feast with the Lord. God grabbed me. He picked me up. He saved me. He did the same thing in your life. And it was this continual feasting. And what would happen is what first thing you would grab in the morning was what? Your Bible. How often do we grab our Bibles in the morning now, guys? Are we still feasting with the Lord on the Word of God? Are we still feasting with the Lord? It's not just the Word, reading the Word. I mean, this whole picture here has this thing of, of this celebration, this feast with God, and kind of made me think of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're all going to be sitting around the tables and feasting with the Lord in heaven. It's a feast when we're walking with the Lord, continual feast. And once we're set free from the power of Satan, and now he's not only going to be told to let them go, Pharaoh's going to be saying, let them go so they can become feast." with me. And you think about Pharaoh's position here, what he's saying, I mean, slaves don't have feasts, slaves serve at the feast. It's, no, not my slaves. You know, Paul said he was a bond slave of Christ. And yet when we're bond slaves of Christ, we feast at the Lord's table, guys. We feast at his table. I wonder, often wonder what it's going to be like in the kingdom. You know, the Bible says we'll sit down with the Lord and we're all going to be there with him feasting and on. And I picture in my mind, I've already shared this with you guys, I'm, not, I'm that little dot in the picture that's way down there at the back, you know. And how in the world could you be close to the Lord if you're this little dot that's way there at the back, you know, that picture that shows the long table and all the whatever? Somehow we're all going to be close and intimate with the Lord. And I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be a continual feast. I'm ready for it. How about you guys? I mean, some of you may be thinking, hey, I wouldn't want the Lord to come back tonight. You know, if, if you're in the place you don't want the Lord to come back tonight, some of it might be youth, you know, you want to experience this, you want to know what it's like to be married, you want to know what it's like to have a kid, you want to whatever. But if you're not in that place and you, you're older and you're not looking for the Lord to come back, you, you want to check your heart. Because I'm telling you, what does this world have to offer us? It's not exactly getting better out there, is it? I'm ready for the Lord. Sometimes, you know, you get tired of the struggle. And uh, I just want to, you know, I want to be able to love you guys and everybody else and everybody love me and not have to worry about all the problems of the world and have all the, you know, the fleshly hindrances that are there. They'll be, they're going to be gone. And so... This feast to the Lord, it begins now. There's going to be the real feast in heaven, but this is a picture of the feast we can have right now. And guys, if you will truly give all your heart to the Lord, you can be feasting with him, enjoying his goodness, because one of the things that quenches the joy of the Lord in the believer's life is a lack of thankfulness. We're not thankful enough. Well, what do I have to be thankful for, Mark? You know, listen, what, look at what you have to be thankful for. Your wife, your kids, your, your home, your vehicle. You know, your, you, I don't have those, whatever. But whatever you do have, you're thankful, your health, your life. To live in America, we have so much to be thankful for. And, and it's interesting. God's been kind of ministering to me about the joy of the Lord recently as he's been restoring my joy. I went through kind of a time of drought. There's a kind of a new joy coming back. And a couple of things that God's really been ministering in my heart is, is Mark, be thankful because in thankfulness is when my joy can flow. Be thankful, number one. But also, the Bible says, note this, in the presence of the Lord is what? The fullness of joy. That's exactly right. It's time with him. It's thankfulness and spending time with him. And so when you get alone with him, say, Lord, I want to spend time with you. Because your word says, in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. How many of you guys tonight want fullness of joy? I do. And it doesn't mean we don't have the issues that we're dealing with, right? It's fullness of joy. And, and so I love this, this whole thing about the feasting here. And yet here we are servants of the Lord and, and yet we're getting served. It's interesting. The Bible says the Lord will serve us. Isn't that amazing? The servants being served. 
So you can see why this is not sitting well with Pharaoh. He's the king of kings, he thinks. These are his slaves. It's not only his slaves, it's part of his income. He used them to build his, his cities. And now this guy comes in that he doesn't know out of the blue and says, let him go. My God, who if you've never heard of, Jehovah says, let him go. He's like, you know what? I don't know your God. Well, he's about to meet him, isn't he? There's about to be a grand introduction that we're going to be going through over the next weeks as we go through this. And he's going to meet him in a, in a grand way. Um, and he's going to never forget him, that's for sure, once he meets him. But again, I love this because, again, God wants to set us free and he wants us to feast with him at the table and he's not going to stop until they're free and can do it. So let them go. Let them come have a feast with me in the wilderness. And notice Pharaoh said, who's the Lord? As I said, he's about to find out, isn't he? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Now notice again Pharaoh's statements. First of all, who is the Lord that I, the great Pharaoh, right? The one who's the God himself, you know, uh, you know, why should I let him go? I, I'm a God already, and I've got my gods. I'm not going to listen to your God of the slaves, if you will. So why should I obey his voice? But secondly, notice this, and this is just like Satan. Again, the whole picture of Pharaoh and Satan, notice this. Who is the Lord that I should let the children of Israel go? In other words, not only did Pharaoh not want to follow and obey the Lord himself, he didn't want anybody else to either. Note that. Not only am I not going to follow the Lord, but I'm going to push for laws that you can't have the Bible in school. Not only do I not want to follow the Lord, I'm going to push for laws that you can't have the Word of God here or prayer at ball games. Not only do I not want the Lord, I'm going to do everything I can to stop everyone else from coming to the Lord. Guys, what's the spirit behind that? It's demonic. Satan is not happy enough that he's not going to be in the kingdom. He wants it to drag as many down with him as he can. He doesn't want anybody else to go. He's, he's not only rebellious himself, he does the best he can to keep us from following and obeying. And he says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? You know, only the creator of the universe. That's who. And people today say the same thing. You know, it's interesting when you talk to people and you share and they say, well, you know, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I'll do what I want. You know, whatever I want to do, that's what I'm going to do. And that's where people are saying, I'm going to be my own God. I'm not going to hear the God of Jehovah. So when people have that attitude, it's really the same as Pharaoh's attitude. When Moses went to him, you know, don't try to tell me what to do. You know, don't lay your whatever, your morality, your religion on me. And, and the neat thing about the Lord is he doesn't force anybody to come, does he? He didn't make anybody come. He gives the freedom to either come or not to come to him. And so if they don't want to, God doesn't make them. But it's interesting. There's a real push today, and maybe you guys have even started hearing of it. There's a real, you know, the atheists are getting much bolder today. And they're pushing even harder to try to pull, you know, God out of every vestige of American life so they can, you know, keep more people from going to be with the Lord. There's already enough slaves in America. We don't need more, do we? And we might think we're free. We're this great country. We're free. But guys, if you don't know Christ, you're in bondage. And there may be some here tonight who don't yet know Christ. If you haven't yet given your life to the Lord, you're in bondage. Pharaoh has you in bondage. He's got you. You're imprisoned to sin. He's got you as his servant. You're doing his will rather than the will of God. I mean, look at your life. What's the fruit in your life? Is it the fruit of God or is it the fruit of the enemy? And that's how you know who you're serving. I love this, though. He says, no, I won't let him go. He has no choice, basically. We're going to see that God makes him let them go. And this is what I love about how the Lord deals with Satan. If you want to be set free and you cry out to the Lord, Satan has no choice but to set you free. And so if you're bound up tonight by the enemy and, and not having a relationship yet with the Lord or bound up in some giant that you've not been able to conquer, there's a giant I can't conquer, Satan has to let go if you cry out to the Lord. And God does it in different ways in all of our lives, but he has to let go. And notice lastly in that verse, he says, I do not know the Lord, nor will I let them go. And again, one of the reasons he wouldn't let them go is because he didn't know the Lord and he'd also set up this pride in his heart. And we're going to see as we go through this passage here again over the next weeks, we're going to see the amazing pride of Pharaoh. And we're going to see the hardness of heart of Pharaoh. But again, we're going to see the love and the grace of God. And I'll tell you, if I was God and I was dealing with Pharaoh, it would be like, this guy is so hard. You let him go, right? He continues to send Moses back to him, Moses back to him to try to convince him and bring him to the, to the throne. But, you know, Pharaoh has nothing to do with it. Finally, God says, all right, that's it. I'm going to let you go because you're not going to come. But the neat thing about the gospel is if we don't harden our heart, guys, God is always there to receive us. But the question tonight is this, is do you know the Lord? But you can't have communion with the Lord if you don't first know him. <laughs> you've got to be his child. You've got to know him. You've got to have the relationship. 
It can't be religion. It can't be just, you know, your parents did it, somebody else did it. It's got to be you and that one-on-one with the Lord. And so that's the first thing that we have to ask ourselves tonight. Have you personally met him? I remember when, um, when I first came back to the South. I grew up in the South. Somebody asked me, Mark, where'd you grow up? I grew up in the South. This is, I'm a Southern boy. I'm a Tennessee boy. And although it's funny, when I'm in the South, people don't think I have that much of an accent. But if I go anywhere else, they say, you've got an accent, you know. Uh, I guess it just depends on I talk too fast for it to really grab on very good. <laughs> I really think that's it. I think I talk too fast for much of an accent, a draw to get in there. But you can still hear that Tennessee accent in there, you know, how it works. And I remember, you know, when I first came back and, and began to share, you know, when I was here the first time, I didn't know the Lord. I went out west. God brought me to himself out there. I came back, and I started sharing with people. And you guys know this. I mean, this is a broken record. Everybody you talk to in the South, what? They know the Lord. Most everybody. Now you got, it's getting, now it's not so blatant. It's getting, there's more who are bold to say they don't. But almost everybody says they know the Lord. That scares me for them because I would have been one of those people. Yes, I know the Lord. I grew up in church. I know the Lord. And I realized that when I would go and share, they would say, do you know the Lord? They'd all say they did. And I was like, what do you do after that? Hey, I'd like to talk to you about Christ. Do you know the Lord? Yep. Oh, okay. Well, God bless you. And it's good to meet you. And you go to the next one. Hey, I'd like to share the Lord. Well, I know the Lord. Oh, okay. And then then you began to see the people that you know, they don't know the Lord. (laughs) I mean, you're watching their life and you watch them there for just a moment. This is a person that's living in the world right now. And they're saying they know the Lord. So I began to change my language. And I would say, look, have you met him personally? On a personal level, have you met him? And, you know, I can remember, you know, one of the responses, well, you mean if I shake in his hand? Well, no, but have you met him on a personal level? That's the question. Have you met the Lord? Do you know him on an intimate level? Because that's what communion is. That intimacy with the Lord. Make sure you've done that. I'm not saying that, again, you need to know him in a personal way like Moses, but that doesn't mean we have to have some burning bush experience, you know, where we have some huge, amazing, it's a miracle when anybody comes to Christ, but it doesn't have to be some amazing burning bush experience. It just has to be, you know, you know him for real and, and you've got that relationship with him, but you need to make sure you have it. And if you don't have that, then tonight's communion is going to mean nothing because communion is only a reminder of what the Lord has done for us. Not only, rather, a reminder of what the Lord has done for us on the cross, but it demonstrates that we have a personal relationship with Him. In one way, it can kind of seem redundant to share the gospel because I know you guys know the gospel, most of you, that I know and know the Lord. But guys, the gospel is simply this, that Jesus died on the cross for you. Now, I can't get this across enough. He died for you. He didn't just die on the cross for the world. I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks for me was he died for the sins of the world. Well, I'm part of the world. So that means what? I'm okay. He died for me. No, I'm not okay. I wasn't okay. I had to realize that he died for me personally, and I had to receive it personally for myself. And then the Bible says that he rose again the third day. So we have to believe in what he's done, ask him to forgive us, ask him to come into our heart, and then give our life to him. It's not difficult, it's not hard, but sometimes there seems to be that disconnect, you know, between making it real and and just going to church. It concerns me because I think, especially in the South, as you guys know this, I think we're epidemic of people who say they know the Lord. And, you know, God is the judge. We know that, right? But come on. I mean, you can, Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Look at the fruit in some people's life. And they say they know the Lord. The evidence is not there. So there's two different groups. Number one, either don't know the Lord or number two, are backslidden if we're living in sin. If you have issues you need to deal with, tonight is the time to do it. Thanks for coming to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark for his study in the book of Exodus. This Old Testament book of the Bible is an interesting one, as it's the end of one era for the people of Israel, heading into a new season for them that leads them back to their homeland. Through the events in this book, you'll learn of God's miraculous ways of bringing people to freedom. Just looking at the seemingly impossible things that God brought about through the book of Exodus helps you realize that He's a God of power, authority, and incredible majesty. The Israelites experienced this firsthand, but it didn't take long for them to forget what he'd done. Can you relate? Perhaps you've seen God work in your life in amazing ways, but it doesn't take long to be back in a place where you feel like God isn't working in your life. If that's so, we'd really like to be a support for you in prayer. If you go to thewaymedia.net, you'll find a questions and comments link. Go ahead and fill out this form, and we'd like to know what we can be praying for, as well as any thoughts or comments about what you've heard today. 
You can also listen to additional teachings at thewaymedia.net. That's all the time we have for today. But Pastor Mark has more to share from the miracle-filled book of Exodus. We hope you'll join us again and learn and grow in ways that God speaks to you personally related to the things written down in Exodus. We're thankful for you taking the time today to listen. And we look forward to you joining us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.